Thank you very much, uh, Ian, and uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Ian, I very much appreciate uh, your warm introduction and the opportunity to uh, be here this evening. I apologise for uh, being slightly late. I'll explain that uh, in just a moment. Can I also acknowledge uh, Lieutenant General David Thompson, fabulous to see you here and a regular visitor to Australia, uh, I know, to the Deputy Chief of Air Force, Air Vice Marshal Gavin Turnbull, and uh, to the very many uh, other distinguished guests and the men and women of the ADF who are here uh, in the room this evening. I also want to uh, begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting here tonight, the Ngunnawal people, and pay my respects to their elders past and present and emerging. Now, the reason I need to explain why I was slightly late is because, as one does, I've spent the last two days in Tonga and the Solomon Islands. And it was a very quick trip back from Honiara this evening. Uh, thank, uh, thanks very much to uh, 34 Squadron and uh, the Royal Australian Air Force, uh, Deputy Chief of Air Force. Uh, and uh, in the um, time uh, that I had uh, this evening to contemplate uh, the remarks I was uh, planning to make, I was thinking about uh, Tonga, Nuku Alofa. They're terrible. I've been saying that 20 times in the last two days. And, uh, and Honiara itself. Because alongside in Tonga last night, we had HMAS Adelaide. And just off shore, HMAS Melbourne, part of Indo-Pacific Endeavour 2018. Part of the work which we set out in the fight paper in terms of international engagement for the ADF and for the defence organisation. There's not a really, there's not really a greater source of pride for a uh, defence minister than uh, being in the Pacific with uh, one of our LHDs and uh, seeing the uh, warmth of the welcome into uh, the uh, port in, uh, in Tonga, seeing the warmth of the welcome of the uh, men and women of the ADF, but not just the men and women of the ADF, the US Marines, Sri Lankan Marines. I saw a Canadian officer on board as I was, uh, as I was coming off the ship last night. That's part of what we do in terms of our international engagement and most particularly in the region. But it won't work for the ADF unless our engagement in space works. Because we can't manoeuvre those ships, we can't do the operations we need to do without the ability and the freedom to operate in space. So I want to make some remarks that talk about the ADF's uh, challenges and opportunities in that regard and to uh, remark uh, on how timely this conference is. And clearly, the announcement of the establishment of Australia's Space Agency is a very good place to start. And I know you got to uh, meet my colleague and my bench buddy in the Senate, uh, Minister Michaelia Cash, this morning. Uh, I did say to, uh, to Margaret Stabe and to Ian Irving, Ian Irving um, Michaelia most days does the colour and the movement and I do the deadly serious. <laughs> oh, well, that's just my gig. But this conference... This ASPE conference, uh, Building Australia's Strategy for Space, is a credit to Peter Jennings and his team in putting together such a timely opportunity for, uh, for this discussion. Across government, we are seeking ways to position Australia for a greater role in space, as I'm sure uh, Minister Cash uh, shared with you this morning. And if we think back to 50 years ago, when the United States, the Soviet Union and the United Kingdom opened the Outer Space Treaty for signature, they could only have been beginning to conceive of the significant role that space would assume in all our lives. And during that space race, space was the domain of the rich and the powerful. The Soviet Union and the United States competing for preeminence and a handful of others, France, Japan, China, the United Kingdom and, as Ian indicated, Australia, had demonstrated the ability to launch rockets. In 2018, the space paradigm has certainly shifted dramatically. Just over two weeks ago, and perhaps some of you were in Singapore at the time, not that Singapore meeting, the one before it, <laughs> I participated in the inaugural female leaders panel at the Shangri-La Dialogue which the IISS uh, has now been holding for, uh, for some uh, 10 iterations, I think, where the discussion, the strategic implications of new technologies on defence policy across all four of the speakers, of which I was honoured to be one, canvassed the common theme of space throughout all of our remarks. As a timely reminder, 
about the relevance of the topic we're discussing uh, this week. So we've now entered the era referred to as Space 2.0. And today, space is characterised by a large number of commercial space entities, a proliferation of cheaper space technologies and the exponential growth of state and non-state actors with space capability. The global space economy is worth around $350 billion US. It's set to grow to two to three trillion dollars over the next 30 years. Governments are now responsible for only a quarter of that global economy, with the remainder belonging to commercial entities. I don't need to tell anyone here of the importance of space technology to our everyday lives. It is, literally, life-saving. Real-time images, positioning data, communications from space-based systems save lives. And it is often most apparent in emergency situations. When disaster destroys terrestrial systems, Australia has been able to deliver based on space-based capability. A really good example, in response to Cyclone Debbie in 2017, Queensland's disaster response team had to use Australian space-based systems to accurately identify damaged infrastructure and coordinate communication, allowing them to act more quickly in their recovery actions, because everything else was out. However, the exponential growth in space has the potential also to threaten its long-term sustainable use. The threats, which I'm uh, sure you're well aware, include the proliferation of space debris, on-orbit crowding and radio frequency interference. The prospect of an incident in space sparking or escalating geopolitical tensions on Earth, or that a terrestrial conflict could extend into space. Quite sobering thoughts. Over the next decade, space will become increasingly congested with growing numbers of both new satellites and space debris. NASA estimates around 500,000 pieces of debris or space junk are orbiting the planet, travelling at speeds up to 28,000 kilometres an hour, posing a danger to all spacecraft, including our own satellites. It doesn't discriminate between civilian or military users. Even the smallest frag fragment of debris travelling at such incredible speeds is enough to disable a satellite system. We can talk about the dangers to space equipment posed by space debris, but it's another issue entirely to speak of deliberate targeting and destruction of space equipment. Capabilities to destroy satellites or degrade their capabilities are being developed, as we know, and as those technologies become more accessible, they will proliferate across the globe. We've already seen the launch of anti-satellite missiles that have destroyed satellites, as well as accidental impacts from uncontrolled satellites, contributing to those significant levels of space debris. These events have focused attention on the dangers of space debris and the intensifying threat of anti-satellite capabilities. It's become clear that one of the most challenging aspects of the space environment is indeed the absence of governance in this unique area. The Outer Space Treaty and the accompanying four treaties on space have formed the foundation of space law over 50 years. These treaties were negotiated and drafted by the UN Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space during the Cold War. Then, they represented a milestone in international law and international cooperation. Whilst these treaties provide some foundational principles, they are, in 2018, somewhat dated. They leave gaps to be filled by national legislation. The complex, interconnected challenges posed by the modern space era require a more global approach. We do need strong measures to increase transparency and build confidence between nations. This can help ensure that earthbound geopolitical struggles don't have catastrophic impacts in space. For defence, Space is a key consideration for both our daily operations and our long-term strategic policy considerations, which is why, as Minister, I'm committed to ensuring Australia and Defence are positioned to benefit from these opportunities and are able to mitigate the risks. Satellite communications are essential to every one of our capabilities, 
fundamental to our ability to plan and execute complex operations over long distances. HMAS Adelaide, HMAS Melbourne, cases in point in Tonga this week and heading out through the Pacific further towards RIMPAC. Use of space-based imagery and other intelligence products enables the ADF to see and understand its environment, ensuring that we can plan and support successful operations. Positioning, navigation, timing through GPS is as critical to our largest warships as it is to a single infantry soldier. Without it, the Air Force would be unable to use its precision weapons to target an adversary while minimising civilian casualties and reducing risk to our own forces. Very literal, very practical and very real. To ensure we're at the, at the cutting edge of space capability, Australia partners closely with the United States and other key allies in space. We rely on the United States for access to high-end space capabilities, even as we work to evolve and grow our own strategic assets. And Australia will also continue to send personnel to advanced space training in the US to ensure that as they progress through their careers, our ADF personnel share an understanding of space with our closest ally and that they can integrate seamlessly into a coalition setting. This integration also requires that our space teams exercise together. And this year, we'll send our largest and most diverse delegation yet to US-led space war games. Testing the limits of our abilities to operate together in space is absolutely central to informed future policy decision making. I want to acknowledge the strength of our partnership with the United States and their leadership, which through these events builds that understanding, the trust, the alignment between both traditional and new space partners. With, our, with the United States and our other Five Eyes partners, we formed the Combined Space Operations Forum in 2013. This meets regularly throughout the year at the working level and culminates in a three and four star annual principals board meeting. This forum has served effectively to connect Australia's national, space endeavor, national security space endeavours with those of our Five Eyes partners in a trusted and highly capable group. It's helped shape a more multilateral view for all five nations which is driving closer alignment of global space architecture across like-minded countries. The integration between operations and policy is fundamental to responsive and relevant space operations. Defence will further develop its close partnerships with our Five Eyes partners and with like-minded nations such as France and Germany and Japan. Indeed, the US has acknowledged, like Australia, that we rely heavily on our international partners to succeed in space. And in the past few years, the United States has made significant efforts to orient their space strategy to prioritise working closely with partners and allies. They recently announced that in the middle of this year, their Joint Space Operations Centre will become a combined space operations centre. That centre will integrate allies and partners into US space operations and will allow for better sharing of information and technology to improve mission assurance and to strengthen space-based deterrence. The creation of the Combined Space Operations Centre provides a really important opportunity for defence to continue to contribute personnel and capabilities as a trusted and valued partner. As you've been discussing uh, probably for most of the day, the government has recently, of course, announced the investment of our uh, Australian, uh, the investment of uh, $41 million to establish the Australian Space Agency. This is an agency which will provide a stronger voice for Australia on the international stage and also provide a key avenue for important civil space engagement throughout our region. The formation of an Australian Space Agency positions Australia well with regard to meeting some of the challenges of the future. It will provide a single focus for civil and commercial activity in space and ensure that our domestic space activities align with our national interest. Over time, we are confident it will strengthen Australia's sovereign space capability and further enable us to deepen our international partnerships in this vital domain. Of course, as our reliance on space-based systems and information has grown, others have noticed. Several nations are developing systems that would challenge our information-fueled way of warfighting. 
for many years. It's perhaps true to say that we thought of space as a sanctuary, a neutral high ground, uh, happily free from interference. But that assumption has, in the uh, cold light of day, had to change. It's, of course, possible that at some point in the future, the Australian Defence Force could be called upon to conduct operations in an environment where our access to space is disrupted and degraded, which the satellites we rely on are directly targeted. The supporting ground stations are subject to interference or damage. Naturally, when we see others developing capabilities that could disrupt, degrade or deny our access to space, we seek to increase our resilience. The 2016 Defence White Paper states that our war fighting depends on our access to space and our freedom of action in space is a fundamental part of our operational capability. It also emphasises that the Australian Defence Force must be prepared to manage the security consequence, consequences of non-geographic threats in space and cyberspace. Both the 2016 White Paper and the Integrated Investment Program make space one of our core capability priorities. The Integrated Investment Program allocates $10 billion over the next two decades to improve our defence space capability. This investment has a number of focuses. It seeks to increase our understanding of space events and prepare for, minimise and potentially recover for, from attacks on our space systems. It will improve our space situational awareness, our intelligence gathering, our positioning, our navigation and our timing and our satellite communication systems. We will continue to ensure that the systems in which we invest are robust, resilient and interoperable with our closest allies. We'll seek to enhance the resilience of our networks through a mix of Australian-owned capabilities, partnerships with allies and commercial arrangements. Of course, systems alone are incapable of generating a true space capability. Without trained operators, planners and supporting staff, the systems by themselves are decorative at best. Defence has to raise and train a force that both understands space and can optimise its use. It must be comfortable operating in a degraded space environment. In the White Paper, we identified up to 900 new positions for intelligence, space and cyber security. These professionals must all be trained to operate and thrive in this new environment, both as individuals and as members of a highly skilled team. This year, Air Force signed an agreement with the University of New South Wales to enhance the technical space education program offered at the Australian Defence Force Academy here in Canberra. This will ensure that from the very beginning of their career, ADF officers with an interest, a propensity, are able to fully comprehend the space environment. Later this year, responsibility for basic operator and executive training in space will move to Air Force's Air Warfare Centre. This move will incorporate space training into Air Force's premier tactics and operational training organisation. It will ensure the training focuses on integration with and support to the joint force. Defence's investment in equipment, personnel and training provides the foundation we need to operate in and prevail in a contested, degraded, disputed space environment. And we will work to deter our adversaries from taking actions that harm our interests in space. It's clear that Australia can't do all of that alone. The strength of our domestic and international partnerships is fundamental to our success in space, just as indeed they are fundamental to our success in terrestrial operations. Domestically, Defence and the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade are working together closely to support efforts to develop and promote international norms regarding the responsible use of space. These efforts align with our contributions towards global security and maintaining the rules-based global order on which our country and our region rely. The gaps in the existing legal framework internationally on space give us the opportunity, the opportunity to work with like-minded countries to develop norms of behaviour that will ensure a secure space environment for future generations. We need 
to call out behaviour that will endanger the use of space. We will continue to increase our space engagement, especially in the region and at the United Nations. 50 years ago, when the Outer Space Treaty was signed, access to space was, as I said, effectively limited to the superpowers. There was not the global commercial space industry we see now. In 2018, that access to space is both easier and more contested. The same technology advances that have helped make space accessible for all have generated systems that threaten that very access. From Defence's perspective, we are ready to harness both the opportunities and meet the challenges. We're developing strategic policy, resilient space capabilities and a well-trained workforce to guarantee our ability to prevail in a contested space environment. Defence will continue to work with our allies to share resources and capabilities to promote sustainable behaviours in space. We are working hard to ensure that Australia can continue to benefit from and play a greater role in space. As many commentators today who have participated in the proceedings and uh, indeed Ian Irving himself have observed, over the last 50 years Australia has become far more invested in space, both commercially and militarily. Our Defence Force is well positioned to protect our access to the very systems from which we derive such benefits. It is tremendously exciting and occasionally confronting to begin to imagine what the next 50 years might bring. Thank you.